Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story and I'm so thrilled to bring our guest today uh, for you all at home watching and reading this, Dr. Rafael Fonseca, who's the Interim Executive Director for Mayo Clinic at large, quite a big title. Um, Dr. Fonseca, welcome. Stephanie, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm delighted to be with, with you all here today. Uh, wonderful, and we will get started shortly, but uh, just to remind people, today we're really focused on you know, of course, multiple myeloma, and there are just so many different areas of research um, in terms of new treatments and therapies, and that's what we're really focused on today. And to take out all that medical jargon, um, to really, you know, speak to the people, so to, so to speak. And before we jump into all of that discussion, Dr. Fonseca, can you just describe a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do? Yes, happy to do that. So as you heard, I'm uh, based at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And I've been practicing in the field of multiple myeloma now for over 23 years that, you know, has been my career at Mayo Clinic. I have a clinical practice where I see patients and monitor patients with myeloma, and I have also a research laboratory. So I spend all of my academic time just caring for, for uh, myeloma patients and doing research around the disease. And of course, very fortunate to have lived through the past, you know, 10 and 15 years where we have seen the explosion of agents that have come forward uh, for the treatment of this disease, which I know we will discuss in greater detail here. Perfect. Um, and, you know, we were lucky enough to be able to talk to you back in 2019 about the basics. And so for anyone who's interested in that, we'll, we'll drop a link for that as well. But um, so Dr. Fonseca, let's start with the first or primary or frontline therapy. Um, as you mentioned, explosion for, um, you know, the relapse refractory segment of the population. But we want to discuss first when someone's newly diagnosed, what they're typically looking at. So we'll cover that, um, you know, right now. Uh, there's the three classes, so proteasome inhibitors, you have imids, and you have mont monoclonal antibodies, which sounds daunting when you're just overwhelmed by diagnosis. So can you break down in sort of human terms, um, you know, what those mean, how, what role they play in the treatment of new myeloma patients? Happy, happy to do that. So, you know, when, when we uh, face a situation of someone who has a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, we have to make some early determinations regarding the best treatment pathway for that person. Uh, there are two general ways, uh, which uh, to this day still, you know, remain. And that is, do, uh, I mean, do you think, or uh, will this person be a good candidate for a stem cell transplant? Because a lot of what we do, uh, you know, comes after that decision is made. And it's not a final decision, but it's just an initial assessment as to whether someone can go through a transplant or not. Um, when, when we do that determination, then usually we come out with a plan that will include the first phase of treatment. We determine induction, but it's just really the first phase of treatment. And that's the initial process by which we want to make sure we clean the person's body from as much myeloma as possible. And certainly prevent any additional complications if the person already is experiencing complications, you know, from the multiple myeloma. Now, uh, you were alluding to the name. So usually we use uh, at least three and very soon four drugs for the first treatment of myeloma. So we use this, this medication cocktails. Uh, you know, people that hear us, if, if, if they, you know, start wondering what is it that they use? So we use um, a lot of what we call small molecules. Uh, and these are treatments that even though they're anti-cancer treatments, they don't really fall into what people, you know, traditionally would think of as chemotherapy. So these are not drugs that would cause hair loss or nausea or vomiting. That's not to say they don't have side effects and they have important side effects we need to recognize, but they, they use, they use a little bit different from what normally one thinks about uh, with, with chemotherapy. Now for the average, you know, individual, this means a combination of injections and pills. Uh, the antibodies, uh, as, as you mentioned, are tumumab being the, the prototype for that is injectable and it can be given under the skin. So it's a subcutaneous administration. Uh, we have another class of drugs that are called the protosome inhibitors. And those are mostly also injectable. One of them, uh, carfilzomib, can be used as intravenous. And then uh, bortezomib is subcutaneous. And the rest is done with pills. So there's, there's usually three, if not four drugs that are going to be used up front. In addition, we have to use a number of medicines that are preventive. So they uh, prevent complications that would arise from some of this, this pills. And they include anti, you know, antivirals and antibiotics. And, and also uh, some of the medications increase the risk of someone forming a blood clot. So there's some blood thinning uh, type medications that are used to, to decrease the risk of that happening. 
Now, for a person who's facing treatment, they should know that, uh, you know, this is obviously with intent of keeping the disease under very good control. But in most situations, we will try to go to a very, very deep response. You know, uh, 25 years ago, and uh, when I was in training, we used to say, well, control is okay, and we're just going to keep, uh, you know, things under a better perspective. But now we know that we have to go for the deepest response possible. In fact, we measure that with more sophisticated tools. We're talking about things uh, such as MRD testing as well, too. And, and the reason we do that is because that seems to translate into better long-term outcomes. So that's you know part of, of, of what we are doing. And, and again, if the person is going through a transplant, we start planning on that from the get-go. But the idea is, is uh, to, to get the disease under better control. And just lastly, you know, if someone who's hearing us says, well, you know, about quality and quantity, the good news in myeloma, they both go hand in hand. So if you're able to deliver an effective treatment and you do so safely without much in the way of complications, you're going to gain both in quality as well as in quantity of life. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know it's a lot to go through. You know, you were talking about there's so many different sort of paths here. I know there are different combinations. You talked about the transplant. Um, how do you determine what path you know, a patient should go down. And I know you're saying you're trying to go for the deeper responses, but, but what comes to mind first when doctors are making these decisions for each patient? You know, as, as we're making the decision, um, we realize that every single situation is unique. And that uh, could be said to be cliche, but it's no, it's absolutely true. So when we see a patient, we start looking at, uh, you know, their disease biology. So we start looking at many factors, including the genetic makeup of those cells that we're going to be treating. It's part of our standard testing. We look at uh, what we call comorbidity. So we want to understand whether heart disease or diabetes or lung disease will create problems as we think about treatment. And then we think about other factors such as, you know, wellness, uh, how fit the person is, how able they are to engage on physical activities as well as their the, you know, social environment. I mean, it, uh, if we see a patient right from when the moment we walk into a room, we're thinking, is this someone who can be coming to the treatment center? You know, do they have issues with transportation and so forth? And, and it is at the end of all of this that we put all of that information together and say, you know, for this particular person, um, you know, this might be the best treatment. Now, oftentimes we use uh, similar treatments even for different groups of patients, but I can tell you almost every single regimen has some permutation or some change that makes it very unique for that person. And, and that could be in the form of dosing, could be in the form of schedule, it could be a different choice for you know, some particular reason. So, so you know, uh, we really cannot do it in a cookie cutter way, if you may. Every patient has to be treated individually. With the frontline uh, treatments and therapies, do you have any um, you know, sort of knowledge to impart on what the most common side effects typically are. I know they vary widely depending on the person as well, but sure. you know, people question, you know, how do I manage this, uh, you know, the, the side effects? And this will be a common theme in the conversation as we, as we talk about these different areas of therapy. So uh, that's a great question. Before I start, I always say, I use my two hands and I point to my chair and I say, everything I say, it's easier said from this chair, right? Meaning from a doctor perspective, I realize I'm not the one who's going to be going through the treatment, but I can explain, I think uh, quite well, just because of having seen hundreds or thousands of patients being treated that you understand what to expect. So uh, I, I would put it in the following general terms, the antibodies, in general, are incredibly well tolerated. And there's some issues that we talk about with infusion reactions or injection reactions, but they're really almost not a problem from a medical side. Everyone gets through them. And I don't have a single patient where we have not been able to get through with the antibody administration. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. It sounds more scary than it ends up being in, in, in general practice. When we talk about uh, the drugs that are called the immunomodulatories, and the most common one is lenalidomide, uh, that comes in a pill form, and that has a few side effects we need to look out for. It's pretty common to have some fatigue. So that's almost expected. In some circumstances, patients will have a rash. It's not really an allergic rash. It's a bit of a rash, and sometimes it gets better. So we try to kind of just push through that with some symptomatic treatment, although it can be severe, and the medicine has to be stopped. And the most important part with, with that, those medicines is that they increase the risk of someone forming a blood clot. 
So we ask patients to keep moving around, stay well hydrated, but all, you know, we, we have to put up a preventive, uh, uh, you know, blood thinner. So I, either an oral blood thinner, which is the most common one or others, but um, in some circumstances we have used aspirin. I'm kind of moving a little bit more towards the anticoagulants just because of the seriousness of the clots, but that's, that's what we do. The, the class of drugs that are called the protosome inhibitors, uh, one of them, the bortezomib is the one that goes under the skin. Um, that one we have to monitor very closely because there's the toxicity called peripheral neuropathy where people get inflammation of the nerves. The consequence of that is uh, decreased sensation and in extreme cases, you know, pain or uh, dysfunction. So we don't want to get there and we can interfere, but we need to hear from patients. Uh, the, the other drug in that category is called carfilzomib. Now, carfilzomib has other toxicities. It's been called cardiorenal, so we have to look at blood pressure, and there could be some issues with heart function or kidney function. We monitor for that. Uh, in most cases, that is reversible. So from what we've seen, if you have to stop the medicine, things come back. So that's that's uh, something we know. Um, so that's for, for the three main drugs. That's kind of my standard. The hardest part oftentimes is the fourth drug, and that is the dexamethasone. Dexamethasone belongs to the steroid class, as you know, it's a corticosteroid. And uh, it, it is a tough drug. I think patients and families tell us that this is one of the hardest parts of the treatment. I usually tell patients, imagine if you take your medicine, you take your dexamethasone on Monday. It's like Monday tells the rest of the week, all those days, hey, send me all your energy. I need it for Monday. So, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, there might be a peak where someone has a lot of energy. And then starting at some point in Wednesday, you're out of energy, you've used it all, so that then you start going into this lull. So there's a little bit of a cycle like this when you when you use dexamethasone. Um, dexamethasone, it's uh, the other way of describing it. I tell patients, it's like you drank three you know, jars of just hard coffee, you know, so you, you, you're gonna be talking a lot, you're gonna be awake, you may have difficulty with insomnia. And also the human brain reacts in a little bit of a funny way with dexamethasone. It makes us impatient and it makes us edgy. So I warn patients and families, you know, this is temporary. Don't, you know, hold it against them. It's going to get better. And the best explanation I have for that is imagine you're in the highway and you're stuck in traffic. I don't care how patient you are. We all start becoming impatient and, you know, start losing our, our, our temper. Right. So mother's Teresa on dexamethasone would have been probably a mean person. So it's really important that we advise patients about this and that, you know, it, it will get better. But sometimes we have to even even uh, either stop or decrease. And then there's some other issues. Patients can have uh, problems with management of their blood sugars. Uh, so someone who's, di who's diabetic may have a harder time with dexamethasone. So that's kind of in a nutshell how I would think about all those treatments. Thank you so much. I know it's a lot to get through, um, but you know, I'm so glad you even painted such a vivid um, sort of picture of the experience on dexamethasone. I've been on steroids for my cancer treatment before. I can attest to a lot of what you're talking about, um, but it is about just having the expectations and managing, right? So that's why you describe this to your patients. You know, Dr. Fonseca, you also mentioned um, sometimes, you know, patients may experience more severe um, side effects and they'll either have to have the dose decreased or they have to be taken off of the drug altogether. In those situations, do you just switch to another drug in the same class or how do you think about moving forward from, from there? You know, it all, it all depends. Um, and and uh, sometimes we decrease dose, sometimes we change the schedule. Um, you know, people would like to think sometimes that medicine is also kind of very, very regimented, but there's quite a bit of an artisanal aspect, if you may, of how we go about this. People say, I need a week break. We have to give them a week break. We have to change the dose of a particular medicine. If there's a serious toxicity, sometimes we, we can't proceed. So we have to stop and we have to change to a different class of drug. But I think for patients, as they hear about this, it's important that they know that there are options. So the important thing is you report uh, you know, your symptoms and how you feel to the, to the healthcare teams and be transparent about that. And the fortunate situation is we have many treatment options. So I have patients, uh, you know, as an example, patients that are going to go through stem cell transplant who maybe don't respond to the first combination, then respond okay to a second one, but have a side effect. Then we try a third one. And I'm talking about a real case. And, and, and the person had come in with renal failure, really tough situation, but the patient could get through a transplant. And now we're many years out from that and he's doing very well. 